from Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's The Cube, covering MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium 2019, brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Hi everybody, welcome back to Cambridge, Massachusetts. You're watching The Cube, the leader in tech coverage. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise, and we're here at the MIT CDO IQ Conference. Chief Data Officer Information Quality Conference. It's the 13th year here at the Tang Building. We've outgrown this building and have to move next year. It's Fire Marshal Full. Gokula Mishra is here. He is the Senior Director of Global Data and Analytics and Former. Supply Chain. Former. At Former Senior Director. Former, I hear, I'm sorry. Yeah. Ah, former <laughs> Senior Director of Global Data Analytics and Supply Chain at McDonald's. Oh, I didn't know that. I apologize, my friend. At, well, welcome back to theCUBE. Uh, we met when you were at Oracle, doing yeah, data. Yeah. Um, so you've left that, you're, you're on to your next big thing. Yes, thinking through it. Fantastic, yeah. you, and now, let's start with your career. I mean, yeah. you've had, so you just recently left McDonald's. I met you when you were at Oracle, so you, you cut over to the dark side for a while. <laughs> and then before that, I mean, you've been a practitioner all your life. So, yeah. so take us through sort of your background. Yeah, I mean, my beginning was uh, really with a uh, company uh, uh, called uh, Tata Burroughs. Uh, those days uh, we did not have uh, um, you know, a lot of work getting done in India. Uh, we used to send people to US, so I was right. one of the pioneers of uh, uh, the, the whole industry, uh, coming here and uh, working on very interesting projects. Um, but uh, I was lucky to be working on mostly data analytics. Uh, related work, I uh, joined a great uh, company called ZS Associates. Uh, I did my master's at Northwestern. Uh, in fact, my thesis was uh, intelligent databases, so building AI into the databases. Uh, and uh, from there on, I've been with uh, Booz Allen, um, Oracle, HP, TransUnion, I used to run my own company, uh, and uh, uh, Sierra Atlantic, which is part of Hitachi, uh, and uh, McDonald's. Awesome, so let's talk about the use of data. It's evolved dramatically, as we know. One of the themes of this conference over the years has been sort of, I, I said yesterday, the chief data officer role emerged from the ashes of kind of governance, kind of back office, information quality, compliance, and then ascended with the tailwind of the big data meme. Uh, and it's kind of come full circle. People are realizing actually to get value out of data, you have to have information quality. So those two worlds have collided together. And you've also seen the ascendancy of the, the chief digital officer who has really taken a front and center role in some of the, you know, the more strategic and revenue generating initiatives. And, and in some ways the chief data officer has been a supporting role to that, providing the quality, providing the compliance, the governance, and the, you know, the data modeling and analytics you know, component of it. First of all, is that a fair assessment? And how do you see the way in which the use of data has evolved over the last 10 years? So to me, primarily, um, the use of data was, uh, in my mind, mostly around financial reporting. So anything that uh, companies needed to run their company, uh, any metrics they needed, any data they needed. So if you look at all the reporting that used to happen, is primarily around metrics that are financials. Whether it's around finances, around operations, finances around marketing effort, finances around reporting, if it's a public company, reporting to the market. Um, that's where the focus was. And so therefore, a lot of the data that was not needed for financial reporting uh, was we, what we call nowadays dark data. This is data we collect, but don't do anything with it. Then, as the capability of um, the computing and the storage and, and new technologies and new techniques evolve and are able to handle uh, more variety and more volume of data, then people quickly realize uh, how much potential they have in the other data outside the financial reporting data uh, that they can utilize to, so some of the pioneers uh, leveraged that and actually uh, you know, improved a lot in their efficiency of operations, uh, came out with innovation, uh, you know, GE uh, uh, come, comes to mind as one of the companies that actually uh, leverage data uh, early on. Um, and number of other companies, uh, obviously you look at uh, today, uh, data has, be, you know, is defining some of the multi-billion dollar company and all they have is data. Well, 
Facebook, Google, Amazon, exactly. Microsoft, exactly. Apple. I mean, Apple obviously makes stuff, but those other companies, they're data companies, right? Correct. I mean, largely. Correct. And if those five companies have the highest market value on the U.S. stock exchange. Yep. Uh, they've surpassed all the other big leaders, even Berkshire Hathaway. <laughs> and and so, so now what is happening is, because the market changes, the forces that are changing the behavior of our consumers and customers, uh, which I talked about, um, which is everyone now is digitally engaging with each other. Uh, what that does is uh, all the experiences now are being captured digitally. All the uh, services are being captured digitally. All the products are uh, creating a lot of digital exhaust of data. And, and so now companies have to pay attention to uh, engage with their customers and partners digitally. Therefore, they have to make sure that they're leveraging data and analytics in doing so. The other thing that has changed is the time to decision, to the time to act on uh, the data insight that you get is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So a lot more decision making is now going real time. Uh, so therefore you, uh, you have a situation now, you have the capability, you have the technology, you have the data, now you have to make sure that you convert that and what I call programmatic uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, data decision making. Uh, obviously there are people involved in uh, more strategic decision making, so that's more manual, right? But at an operational level, it's going more programmatic uh, decision making. Okay, I want to talk, by the way, uh, I've seen a stat, and I don't know if you can confirm this, that 80% of the data uh, that's out there today is dark data. In other words, data that's behind a firewall or you know, not searchable, not open to Google's crawlers. So there's a lot so of value I, there. I would say that that percent is uh, declining over time as uh, companies have realized the value of data. So more and more companies are removing the silos, bringing those dark data out. Uh, I think the key to that is companies being able to um, value their data. And as soon as they are able to value the data, uh, they are able to leverage a lot of the data. I, I still believe there's a large percent uh, still not used or accessed right. in companies. Well, and, and of course, you talked a lot about data monetization. Doug Laney is an expert in that topic. We had Doug on a couple years ago when he, just after he wrote Infonomics, he was on yesterday. Uh, he's got a very detailed prescription as to he makes a strong case as to why data should be you know, valued like an asset. Um, I don't think anybody really disagrees with that, uh, but then he gave kind of a how to do it, which will somewhat make your eyes bleed, but it was really well thought out, uh, as you know. Uh, but you talked a lot about data monetization. You talked about a number of ways in which data can contribute to monetization. Revenue, cost, reduction, efficiency, risk, and innovation. Um, Revenue and cost is obvious. I mean, that's where the starting point is. Yep. Efficiency, I, I, it's interesting. I, I look at efficiency as kind of a, a doing more with less. But it's sort of a cost reduction, but explain why it's not in the cost bucket. It's something so, it's different. So it is first starts with doing what we do today cheaper, better, faster. And doing more comes after that. Because if you don't understand and data is the way to understand how your current processes work, you will not take the first step. So, so part of that's time you to You take value. the first step is to understand how can I do this process uh, faster. And then you focus on cheaper, and then you focus on better. Of course, faster is uh, because of some of the market forces and con customer behavior that's driving you to do that process faster. Okay, and then the other one was uh, risk reduction. I think that makes a lot of sense. You're, Actually, let me go back. So, so one of the key pieces of, it, of, 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 of efficiency is time to value. Correct. So if you, can, if you can compress the time or accelerate the time, you get the value, that means more cash in-house faster, whether it's cost reduction or, or, and, or and, and the other aspect you look at is, can you automate more of the processes and, 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 and that way it can be faster. And that hits the income statement as well because you're reducing you know, headcount cost, or you're maybe, maybe not reducing headcount cost, but you're getting more out of, of headcount, you're reallocating them to more strategic that is in initiatives. Everybody says that, but the reality is you hire less people because you, you, know, you just automated. Um, and then risk reduction, so the degree to which you can lower your expected loss. 
right? That's just you know, thinking in insurance terms. That's a tangible value, to, certainly to large corporations, but, but even mid-sized and small corporations. Innovation, I thought, was a good one, right? But maybe you could use an example of, uh, or give us an example of how in your career you've seen data contribute to innovation. So I'll give you an example of oil and gas industry, right? Uh, if you look at uh, speed of innovation in oil, oil and gas industry, um, they were all paper-based. Uh, I don't know how much you know about drilling. Uh, <laughs> a lot of the assets that goes into figure, figuring out where to drill, how to drill, uh, and ex actually drilling and then uh, taking the oil or gas out and, and of course selling it to make money. A um, lot of those processes were paper-based. Right? So if you, can, if you can imagine trying to optimize a paper-based uh, innovation, uh, uh, it's, it's very hard. Uh, not only that, it's very, very by itself, because it's on paper, it's in someone's drawer or file. So it's siloed by design, right? And so one thing that uh, the industry has gone through, they recognize that they have to optimize the processes to be better, uh, to innovate, uh, to uh, find, for example, shale gas uh, uh, was a result output of digitizing the processes because otherwise you can't drill faster, cheaper, better to leverage some of the shale gas drilling that yes. they did. <laughs> so the industry went through actually digitizing a lot of the paper assets. So they went from not having data to knowingly creating the data that they can use to optimize the process, and then in the in the process, they're innovating uh, new ways to drill the uh, uh, the, the the oil uh, well, yeah. cheaper, better, faster. You know, early days of oil exploration in the U.S. go back to the the Os Osage Indian tribe in uh, in northern <laughs> Oklahoma, and they brilliantly, when you know they got shuttled around, they pushed them out of Kansas, and they negotiated with the U.S. government that they maintain the mineral rights. And so they became very, very wealthy. In fact, at one point, they were the wealthiest per capita individuals in the entire world. And they used to hold auctions for you know, various you know, drilling rights. Yep. So it was all gut feel. All the oil barons would train in and they would have an auction. And it was just, again, it was gut feel as to which areas were the best. And then, of course, as things evolved, remember it used to be you'd, you'd drill, a, drill a hole, oh, no oil, drill a hole, no oil. You know oil. how much drill that costs? Hole, no oil. Yeah, the expense is yeah. enormous, it right? It can vary from 10 to $20 million. <laughs> it's just a giant yeah. expense. Yeah, yeah. And so now, yeah. today, fast forward to the you know this century, and you're seeing much more sophisticated. Yeah, I can give you another example in uh, pharmaceutical. Uh, mm -hmm. They develop new drugs. Uh, it takes a, it's a long process. So one of the initial processes is to figure out what molecules uh, they should be exploring uh, in the next step. And you could, you could have thousand different combinations of molecules that could uh, treat a particular condition, right? And now they, with, with digitization and data analytics, they're able to do this in a virtual world. Kind of creating a virtual lab where they can test out you know, thousands of molecules. And then once they can you know, bring it down to a fewer, then the physical aspect of that starts. Think about innovation really shrinking that process. Yeah. I want to ask you about cloud. So I was, so <laughs> okay, you, okay, you okay. made the statement in your keynote that uh, how many people out there think cloud is, is cheaper? A and, or maybe you even said cheap, but cheaper, I, th I inferred cheaper than on-prem. And so, it was a loaded question, so nobody put their hand up, they were afraid. But I put my hand up, because we, <laughs> we don't have any IT. We used to have IT, it was a nightmare. So for us, it's better. But, but in your experience, I think, I think I'm inferring correctly that you'd meant cheaper than on-prem. And certainly we talk to many practitioners who have large systems that when they lift and shift to the cloud, they don't change their operating model, they don't really change anything, they get a bill at the end of the month and they go, Ugh, what did this really do for us? And I think that's what you mean. But, so, but so what I mean is, let me, let me make it clear, is that there are certain use cases uh, that cloud is cheaper. And as you saw, uh, that people did kind of raise their hands saying, yep, yeah, I have use cases where cloud is cheaper. I think you need to look at the whole thing. Right, Cost is one aspect. The flexibility and agility of being able to do things is another aspect. For example, uh, if you have a situation where your uh, stakeholder want to do something for three weeks and they need five times the computing power and the data that they are buying from outside uh, to do that experiment, right? Now imagine doing that in a, in a physical uh, world. 
you know, it's going to take a long time just to procure and get the physical And then boxes. you own the asset after the fact. Uh, yeah. And then, then you'll be able to do it. In cloud, you can enable that. You can get uh, GPUs, depending on what problem you're trying to solve. That's another benefit. You can uh, get the fit for purpose computing environment uh, to that. Uh, and, and so there are a lot of flexibility, agility, all of that. It's a new way of managing it, so people need to pay attention to the cost because it will add to the cost. The other thing I, you know, I, I, point, I will point out is that if you go to the public cloud, because they make it cheaper because they have hundreds and thousands of this canned uh, CPU, right? This much computing power, this much memory, this much desk, this much connectivity. And, and they build thousands of them and that's why it's cheaper, right? Uh, well, if your need is something that's very unique and they don't have it, you know, that's when it becomes a problem. Right? Either you need more of those and the cost will be higher, right? Mm -hmm. so, so now we are getting to the IoT world. The volume of data is growing so much and the type of processing that you need to do is becoming more real time and, and you can't just move all this bulk of data and then bring it back and move the data back and forth. Uh, you need a special type of computing which mm -hmm. is at, uh, you know, at the, what Amazon calls it, edge computing. Right? And, and the industry is kind of oh, yes. trying to design it. Yeah. So that is an example of hybrid computing evolving out of the cloud, uh, out of the necessity that you need special purpose computing environment to deal with new situations, and all of it can't be in the cloud. Yeah, I mean, I would argue, well I guess, you know, I guess Microsoft with Azure Stack was kind of the first, although not really. Uh, now they're, they're there, but I would say Oracle, your former company, was the first one to say, okay, we're going to put the exact same infrastructure on-prem as that we have in the public cloud. Uh, Oracle, I would say, was the first to re truly do that. They were, they were doing hybrid you, computing. You, you now see yeah. Amazon with Outposts has done the, the, the same. Google kind of has similar uh, approach as, uh, as Azure, and so it's clear that, that hybrid is here to stay, at least for some period of time. Uh, I think the cloud guys probably believe that ultimately it's all going to go to the cloud. We, you know, we'll see. It's going to be a long, long time before that happens. <laughs> okay, um, I'll give you last thoughts on this this conference. Uh, is this you've been here before? Or is this your first? This one? is my first one. Okay, so yeah. um, your takeaways, your your thoughts, things you might. I learned. I am very impressed that uh, I, you know I'm a practitioner, right? Um, and uh, finding so many uh, practitioner coming from so many different backgrounds and industries. Uh, it's very, very uh, uh, enlightening to listen to their journey, their story, uh, their learnings uh, in terms of uh, what works and what doesn't work. Uh, it is, it is uh, really invaluable. Yeah, I, I tell you this, um, this is always a highlight of our season. And uh, Gokula, thank you very much for coming on theCUBE. It's great to see you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest, Dave Vellante. Paul Gillen is in the house. You're watching theCUBE from MIT. We'll be right back. Stop! <laughs>